Uh, so good morning, everyone. Uh, I am Abhishek Putnis. I am a PhD student at uh, the Center of Studies in Resources Engineering at IIT Bombay. Uh, I'll be uh, talking about flood mapping with Google Earth Engine. So uh, floods are among the Earth's most common and most destructive natural disasters. Uh, thousands are rendered homeless while numerous succumb to this dreadful calamity during floods. Uh, moreover, urban floods is a particularly serious issue. Uh, that has resulted in catastrophic loss of life and property uh, in recent years. Uh, specifically, uh, in Mumbai, we had uh, a, a case of severe flooding this week from uh, July 2nd. Uh, uh, IMD reported about uh, 375 millimeter of rainfall was received in just a span of 24 hours. Uh, that that caused lots of water logging on streets. Uh, you know, some electrocution cases were also reported, and about 22 uh, fatalities were reported. Uh, so. Disasters such as floods not only ruin our habitat, but also adversely affect the uh, nation's economy at large. Uh, so uh, there is a dire need actually for uh, effective disaster management and assessment techniques to alleviate, to help alleviate the losses caused by such disasters. So one of the solutions uh, that, uh, one of the possible solutions to alleviate these losses uh, uh, comes from uh, the technologies uh, developed in the uh, in the domain of remote sensing. So uh, typically, uh, remote sensing platforms uh, categorized for disaster assessment uh, are uh, classified into two types: uh, the spaceborne platforms and the airborne platforms. Uh, so the the spaceborne platforms have on board uh, remote sensing sensors and uh, that are mounted. So spaceborne platforms include satellites. Uh, whereas uh, airborne platforms include, you know, airplanes that are mounted with uh, uh, cameras, hyperspectral cameras, and of course the uh, popular nowadays uh, the drones. So uh, these uh, these type of uh, remote sensing platforms form an app choice during a disaster assessment and management uh, scenario. Uh, typically, when the area on the ground is inaccessible. So in case of flooding, uh, one cannot actually go there for uh, surveying and uh, assessing uh, how much loss has been caused and where are the damages due to the floods. So remote sensing uh, platforms form an app choice for such kind of cases. So uh, with that in mind, uh, so uh, I'd like to talk about the satellite products that can be used for uh, disaster assessment. So, out of the uh, many satellites that are uh, that have been launched from different places uh, on in the world, uh, the Landsat and the Sentinel are the two popular uh, satellite uh, satellite programs that have been uh, initiated. So, the Landsat program uh, 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 initiated by uh, the U United States uh, Space Agency, that is NASA, uh, ha has a series of uh, satellites uh, th that they have launched uh, typically for Earth observations. Uh, the latest one uh, being Landsat 8 that was launched in uh, in the February of 2013. Uh, so the Landsat 8 is known to have a spatial resolution of about 30 meters. Uh, so one pixel of uh, in the imagery of the satellite uh, captured by Landsat maps to 30 meters on the uh, Earth surface. Uh, similarly, Sentinel is another uh, satellite program that was initiated by uh, uh, that was initiated under the Copernicus program by European Space Agency. Uh, so even Sentinel has a series of satellites that have been launched. Uh, so the Sentinel, uh, uh, the uh, Sentinel 2A, has specifically has a spatial resolution of 10 meters, while the Sentinel 1 has a spatial resolution that uh, that is down to about 5 meters. So again, uh, uh, these satellites that have been launched have a different type of remote sensing sensors on board them. So uh, just to uh, give you a brief. Uh, remote sensing uh, is classified into two types, that is active remote sensing and passive remote sensing. So active remote sensing uh, involves uh, some kind of uh, radiation that has that is emitted by the satellite, that is emitted by the sensors that hits the surface of the Earth and the reflected uh, radiation is then captured by these sensors and the analysis is further done. Whereas passive remote sensing uh, involves uh, measuring uh, uh, the radiation that is emitted from the Earth's surface. So there is uh, no uh, form of radiation that is emitted by the sensors in, in passive remote sensing. So typically, um, uh, like uh, for instance, the the mobile cameras that we use, right? So they are, they they can be seen as an example of passive remote sensing. 
because uh, they uh, they simply capture the wavelengths that are reflected back into the camera they do not emit any uh, radiation as such uh, so uh, coming back to our disaster scenario specifically speaking about uh, the flood domain so during the flood uh, typically what happens is there are overcast overcast conditions uh, including cloud cover uh, dense clouds uh, can be seen so uh, if if seen from a satellite's perspective so uh, the the active remote sensing platforms that capture imagery in the visible domain that is the rgb and probably uh, like infrared so uh, these platforms are not very effective because these sensors to be uh, precise these sensors are not very effective because all they can see are the clouds from the satellite perspective so typically uh, for a disaster such as floods uh, my the active remote sensing option is uh, encouraged so in case of active remote sensing microwave uh, remote sensing to be precise uh, is used so uh, microwave remote sensing platforms or microwave remote sensing sensors emit microwave radiation so that has a shorter wavelength and has a capacity to penetrate through the clouds and reach the earth surface so uh, and also one important thing is in case of active remote sensing uh, at night time it is difficult to infer what we are actually seeing on the ground but that is not the case with active remote sensing in active remote sensing again because of the advantage uh, advantage of uh, microwave remote sensing that uses uh, short wave uh, radiation so short wavelength uh, radiation so we uh, the uh, the the satellite center sensors are typically you know termed as all day uh, and all weather satellite sensor so Sentinel-1, uh, the satellite has a C-band uh, synthetic aperture radar, uh, so C-band SAR that we call it, so uh, in short, so that is one of the sensors that is typically encouraged uh, to use in case of uh, disaster scenarios such as flood. So uh, I have put together a couple of case studies uh, for this uh, this particular talk, uh, uh, and I'll be uh, discussing on, uh, on those. So for both these uh, case studies are uh, for uh, different regions uh, of the world. And uh, in both the scripts that I've put together, use uh, the Sentinel-1 uh, C-band uh, uh, synthetic aperture radar imagery. So uh, uh, I'll quickly uh, move on to the case studies. So uh, the first case study that we'll discuss is of the Hurricane Harvey uh, that uh, hit in uh, uh, August 2017 uh, in, in, uh, in the United States of America. So. Uh, the, uh, now, typically, uh, because we are talking about flooding, uh, so uh, the, the chain of events is that uh, what happened was the Hurricane Harvey caused uh, flooding in some parts of the United States. So I'm going to be I am going to focus on the flooding that happened because of this hurricane. Uh, so now typically, uh, uh, floods uh, in general are classified into uh, like three or four subtypes. Uh, is the flash floods and other is the pluvial or the riverine flooding that is called. So the flash floods are typical floods that are caused by extreme events such as uh, rainfall, uh, like high amounts of precipitation that happens over a region and the runoff water is not absorbed into the ground. So that results in water logging on the streets and uh, uh, ultimately causing flooding uh, and uh, great damage to uh, property and life. So that is about the flash floods. and. Uh, the riverine flood or the fluvial flood, as the name suggests, is because of a river or a water body overflowing. So the banks of the river overflow and the water gets inundated about uh, along the uh, uh, edges of the water body, causing uh, the, the, the areas near the rivers to be flooded. So in particularly in this case, uh, the Hurricane Harvey, uh, this Colorado River in Texas, USA, uh, uh, was known to uh, be the result of fluvial flooding. So uh, in this script that uh, I have put together here, you can see the RGB satellite imagery captured by the Sentinel-2 multispectral uh, sensor on board the Sentinel-2. So uh, uh, as I said, it is uh, the imagery is captured in the visible range. Uh, so and uh, so the uh, red, green, blue channels have been visualized uh, in, uh, in this uh, screen that we see. So and uh, the C-band synthetic aperture radar from Sentinel-1 has been used to uh, detect uh, flooding uh, in, in this particular case study. So uh, essentially what uh, this script does is uh, that uh, it takes two imageries, one of the post-hurricane Harvey and one of the pre-hurricane Harvey, C-band SAR imagery, 
and uh, computes the the basic operation of difference. So uh, post uh, uh, Harvey uh, post Hurricane Harvey image minus the pre Hurricane Harvey image followed by a smoothing operation to you know minimize the speckle noise that we have and uh, uh, followed by thresholding to identify the flood flooded regions. So we can see actually which uh, parts of the uh, satellite imagery were actually flooded. So uh, so this is the uh, result of the difference operation followed by the smoothening and thresholding. So we can clearly see that the brown uh, regions indicate uh, how the flooding has actually happened when we uh, did the difference operation on Google Earth engine. So this is again a very basic operation that Google Earth engine, uh, like there are a host of operations that Google Earth engine has to offer. But uh, this, these were the two scripts that I, uh, you know, I experimented with when I first learned about Google Earth engine. Uh, just to get an insight of how uh, the flooding actually happens. And uh, I found it pretty useful. Like we can actually see uh, how the flooding has happened on the coastal uh, uh, regions of the, uh, the river uh, Colorado. So we can clearly conclude from uh, this uh, result that most of the flooding that happened because of Hurricane Harvey was fluvial flooding, that is riverine flooding. And you know, uh, accordingly, uh, since now we know that uh, the flooding typically during the hurricanes uh, happens because of the river overflowing. So measures like evacuation or uh, uh, other uh, water conservation uh, measures can be taken to uh, alleviate the losses caused by such, such kinds of flooding. Uh, so this was uh, the Hurricane Harvey case study that uh, I had considered using uh, basic operations in Google Earth Engine. Uh, Similarly, uh, this is the second case study of the Flinders River in Australia, in Queensland to be precise. So uh, this is a more uh, recent uh, case study. So in January 2019, uh, we can see that uh, uh, the Flinders River is uh, actually this one. And uh, the other rivers that are, you can see are uh, the, the tributaries of this river. So this was in January 2019. And uh, what happened was, uh, in February of 2019, due to excessive amounts of rainfall, the river actually swelled to this particular size. So the brown regions that you see are the swollen uh, version of the Flinders River. Uh, so this, the width of the river is has been reported to you know be around about 60 kilometers in width. So uh, this was again caused by excessive rainfall. So again uh, the the difference operation of the C-band SAR imagery was performed followed by a smoothing and thresholding to identify uh, this. So again, we can conclude that this kind of uh, flooding is a case of uh, uh, river in flooding or fluvial flooding. Uh, so uh, yeah, so so the idea was you know to understand how uh, how and where actually the inundation patterns happen uh, when uh, the flood occurs. So these were the two case studies that I had uh, taken up uh, uh, the Hurricane Harvey and the Flinders River was one. Now, uh, these two, uh, for these two case studies, the satellite products that were used were the Sentinel-1 uh, C-band SAR and the Sentinel-2 MSI multispectral imagery. So both of these satellite products are openly available on the Google Earth Engine uh, in, uh, data catalog. So one can easily just you know import it into the platform and perform analysis and uh, perform the, the processing and analysis and uh, you know uh, derive actionable insights from uh, the the analysis. So, but then uh, the the beauty of Google Earth Engine platform is that we uh, it, it is not restricted to you know you only using the satellite products that are by default into the platform that can be imported, but it also supports uh, you know uploading custom raster satellite imagery. So uh, for this particular, uh, like the feature of Google Earth Engine, I have put together a small uh, this uh, screenshot, this G uh, GIF uh, for uh, understanding. So this is uh, more related to my uh, PhD thesis topic on urban floods. So I, I focus uh, my research area on the urban floods, uh, typically focusing on the uh, streets and cities, how the uh, and uh, land use land cover classes interact with one another spatially during a flood scenario. So uh, this particular uh, satellite imagery is not available in Google Earth Engine. It is of a, a different satellite, a worldview, a worldview two satellite, uh, and uh, it is it is it is a very high resolution satellite imagery. Uh, so I think the the spatial resolution is about uh, 0 0.43 meters, uh, and uh, so. 
uh, yeah so so the idea of uh, you know adding this in my talk was to demonstrate that you know we can upload a custom satellite imagery onto google earth engine and perform analysis so as i mentioned that uh, i primarily work on classifying a satellite imagery into different lulc classes like uh, the machine should be able to you know predict that this particular pixel belongs to this particular class so for that uh, you know machine learning uh, techniques or approaches are uh, preferred so again in machine learning uh, supervised and unsupervised classification approaches can be taken so in this particular case uh, i have taken the supervised machine learning approach uh, and uh, so you can see these polygons that have uh, been drawn uh, uh, in the gif uh, uh, yeah so it will just come up so yeah so these green red blue and yellow polygons that i have manually annotated using google earth engine's uh, editing tools so so that was my way of telling the uh, the machine that these are the classes so the blue uh, blue polygons indicate water the flood water the red uh, polygons indicate buildings the green polygons indicate uh, vegetation and the yellow polygons indicate fallow land so these were the classes that i specifically told the machine uh, like uh, like so uh, in, in in the machine learning terms uh, this was the training data that i provided to the machine learning algorithm and uh, google earth engine again has a host of inbuilt uh, machine learning algorithms into it so i uh, the the most simplest to use among them is the random forest which just takes as uh, input uh, the the satellite imagery the training data in in, in terms of geometry and uh, one hyperparameter that is the number of trees so uh, i guess for a number of trees of uh, 50 Uh, the, uh, the yeah so the result of the random forest will just come up yeah so so this was the result of the random forest classifier so you can see that uh, you know the entire image is filled up and uh, so each pixel is now uh, assigned a class so even those pixels that were not trained by me initially have been assigned the class mostly correctly of uh, the flood water uh, the buildings the vegetation and the fallow land so so uh, so the conclusion of uh, this particular slide uh, like uh, is to you know demonstrate the earth engine's capability to work with custom uploaded uh, satellite imagery of course the satellite imagery needs to be geo referenced before uploading and then uh, you know you can perform your processing and analysis over such satellite imagery so uh, yeah so I, i i would like to conclude my uh, talk here so to summarize my uh, talk we started with uh, discussing the seriousness uh, of the disaster of floods uh, you know the the dire need of you know effective disaster assessment and management techniques uh, that can help alleviate uh, losses caused by the flood disaster remote sensing forms an uh, apt solution in case of uh, such uh, situations when the area on the ground is not accessible and uh, particularly uh, microwave remote sensing from synthetic aperture radar uh, is a good choice during uh, the flood scenario when there is significant cloud cover and there is a necessity of you know being able to see satellite imagery during night too so we discussed two case studies of the hurricane harvey and uh, the flinders river and concluded that both the floodings were the cases of riverine flooding or fluvial flooding caused by the overflowing of the river uh, colorado in case of hurricane harvey and the flinders river in, in australia and lastly we uh, uh, we uh, like uh, we elaborated on uh, the uh, feature of google earth engine to work with customly uploaded uh, you know raster data and do uh, classification over it so yeah with that uh, i would like to conclude this talk uh, thank you uh, I, i i sincerely thank the earth engine community to give me this opportunity to discuss my work with you all thank you thank you for this